Hey everybody, Mark Fox here with Amazing Prophecies YouTube channel, Forever Free Ministries. What is the mark of the beast? How will the mark of the beast be received? How will the mark of the beast be enforced? What is the seal of God? Does anyone have the mark of the beast today? That and more. Stay tuned. Just before we dive into this urgent message, I want to get into your hands a powerful book called The Mark of the Beast, which identifies the Antichrist Beast and the Mark of the Beast and much more. All you need to do is click on the link below. You can also give a donation, which is appreciated but not required. Once again, just click on the link below. Now let us go to my urgent message entitled Revelations Mark of the Beast. Jesus wants you to know now. Once again, welcome. Tonight's message is on the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast. Who is the Antichrist beast of biblical prophecy? What is the mark of the beast? Who will receive the mark of the beast? What is the image to the beast? What is the seal of God, the opposite of the mark of the beast? How will the mark of the beast be enforced? What will lead majority to demand the mark of the beast? Does anyone already have the mark of the beast? These and many more questions will be answered in tonight's Bible teaching. So what will lead majority to demand the mark of the beast? In order to know what the mark of the beast is, we must first identify the beast. How does the Bible describe it? And we've had an entire message dealing with the Antichrist of Daniel 7, and then we had another message last night covering the subject of the Antichrist beast. So this is going to be a little bit of a review here at the beginning with some additional information, then we're going to get right into what is the seal of God, what is the mark of the beast. But first things first. So Revelation chapter 13 provide these 11 identifying marks or characteristics. Number one, and you'll notice the verses. All of these verses are right from Revelation 13. Number one, it arises from the sea. We're talking about this composite beast of Revelation 13. Number two, it is a composite of the four beasts we've already seen in Daniel 7. Number three, the dragon or the dragon working through pagan Rome, gives it its power and authority. Number four, it receives a deadly wound. Number five, its deadly wound is healed. Number six, it is a strong political power. Number seven, it is a strong religious power. Number eight, it is guilty of blasphemy claiming to forgive sins, claiming titles and prerogatives that only belong to God solely, exclusively. Number nine, it wars and overcomes and persecutes the saints. Number 10, it rules for 42 months. 42 times 30 days in a biblical month is 1260 days. One day equals a year. That's 1260 years. We've seen that in previous presentations. This time period is revealed seven times in the books of Daniel Revelation, cumulative. Twice in the book of Daniel, five times in the book of Revelation. So a very, very important time period during which the Antichrist would have an unparalleled, unprecedented reign of terror. Number 11. It has a mysterious number, 666. So, the Protestant reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, the Wesley brothers, John Knox, William Tyndale, Wycliffe, Melanchthon, and a host of others believed that the Antichrist is the Roman papal power. So, the beast is a composite of the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7, as I mentioned. And so, here is a chart. Here is a comparison between Daniel 7, the powers there, and then Revelation 13, the composite beast. In Daniel 7, we see a lion-like beast. And then in the composite beast, we see a mouth of a lion. This is talking about Babylon. Then Medo-Persia, 
bear-like beast in Daniel 7, feet of a bear in Revelation 13. Greece, leopard-like beast in Daniel 7, like a leopard, the body of a leopard there in Revelation 13. Rome, ten-horned beast of Daniel 7, verse 7, and then the composite beast having ten horns. So can you see the striking similarities and comparisons between the two? What does this mean? It means that the Antichrist beast, Revelation 13, inculcates, inherits, embraces different practices that were prevalent in Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. In other words, this apostate religious system is an amalgamation made up of some things that were very prominent and widespread in Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So this Antichrist beast is a religious system with a lot of paganism embraced with Christianity. So the beast receives its power, throne, the word throne in the Greek is thronos, which means basically a, a capital seat or a seat from which you rule, a capital, and authority from the dragon. And the dragon worked through pagan Rome. So listen to this historical quote from the book, What is Christianity? The Roman church pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual what? Continuation. The Pope is Caesar's successor. Well put. So next, it would receive a deadly wound, Revelation 13, 3. The deadly wound was inflicted when Napoleon's general Alexander Berthier entered Rome and took Pope Pius VI uh, captive in February of 1798, exactly 1260 years from 538 AD when it got political power, then 1798 when it would lose political power, it would lose its prestige and power temporarily. Then it would have a resurgence. It, it, resurgence. it would have a comeback. There would be a healing. Now, Napoleon decreed that at the death of the Pope, the papacy would be discontinued. The Pope died in France in August of 1799. Quote, half Europe thought that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. So this point also fits the papacy. Now, the deadly wound would be healed. And the entire world would give homage to the beast. The Bible says the whole world would wander after the beast in a variety of ways. So since its healing, the strength of the papacy has grown. Today, she is one of the most powerful religious, political organizations and influence centers in the world. So about the Pope. He is the most well-known person in our world. People all over the world see him as a strong moral leader. Thousands of Catholics and non-Catholics throng to him when he visits other countries. For example, as I mentioned in previous presentation in 2015, he spoke before a joint session of the U.S. Congress for the first time in history. Now that's a photograph that is a dramatic confirmation of amazing prophecies found in Den Revelation. Friends, we are seeing the unfolding of Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy in the headlines. Bible prophecy in the evening news. And so, the eyes of the nations are upon the Vatican. Is that true? Yes or no? It's true, isn't it? The papal structure is prepared for worldwide control. Ambassadors from most countries of the world, work very closely with the Vatican. And so, it would make war and persecute the saints, according to Revelation 13, verse 7, and also Daniel 7. The Roman papal power is guilty and behind destroying, persecuting, killing 50 million people, 50 million precious saints during the long, bloody dark ages. The Bible predicted it. History reveals it. What are we going to do with this? We're going to protest. 
By you coming here and saying, I believe this, you are protesting this false teachings. My friends, we must continue to be true protestants. Amen? We must, what's the root word in Protestant? Protest. This does not mean that God is against Catholics. If you are a Catholic, God is for you. He loves you. But Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And it can set you free from false religious practices and teachings. There's power in the truth, isn't there? What's our motto, everyone? If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. And so here's more. If you understand the seal of God first, you are better prepared to know what the mark of the beast is. First things first. We already know. We can put a check mark. We already know who the Antichrist beast is. All right. Now we're going on to uh, the seal of God. We need to understand what the seal of God is before we can really categorically nail down uh, what is the mark of the beast. So because the seal is a matter of life and death. We cannot afford to engage in blind guesswork or idle speculation or tabloid sensationalism about what it is. And we certainly are not interested in a, a novel series called Left Behind because it left behind the truth. So what is the seal of God? The key is to find out where the seal of God is placed. Everybody shout out where. Okay, we want to know where is the seal of God placed. These are keys and clues that we're looking at tonight in our quest and journey to nail down what is the mark of the beast and how do you avoid it. So it says in Revelation 7, would you read it with me? Everybody together, here we go. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Continue. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I know Nick in the quiz uh, uh, reminded us of these things. So notice, the seal of God does not go in the hand. It only goes in the forehead. What does this mean? That's what we're unpacking here tonight. But this is very significant. The Bible makes it very clear. God is up to something. He is going to seal his faithful and then the tribulation will come. Now I will read God's final warning to the world. Listen carefully and prayerfully to every inspired word of the three angels' messages. Then I saw another angel. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to read, but I'm going to let you fill in some blanks. All right? You ready? Those watching by YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, uh, you can fill in the blanks as well. So as the lightning flashes in the background, notice, uh, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. To what? Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Everybody must hear this. Every village, every city, every country needs to hear these messages. Saying with a what kind of voice? Loud voice. It's urgent. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. We had a whole message about the judgment. And worship him. Read the yellow part with me. Worship him who what? Made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Worship him who made. Who would you call the person who made us and made the world? Our creator. That's right. So notice here. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This would be what kind of worship? This would be true worship. Worship of the creator. That is true worship. In stark contrast, verses 9 to 11 depict the three, the third angel's message. So then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice. So this is urgent. It's not politically correct, but it's the truth. If anyone worships the beast, is that true worship or false worship? That's false worship. Worships the beast. We already know who the beast is. 
And this is for Catholics and Protestants. This is for people of all denomination or no denomination. And so it's for everybody. Everybody needs to hear this. Worships the beast in his image. This is a dire warning. And receives his mark on his forehead or on his what? On his hand. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. This is not good. Which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. And in the presence of the Lamb. This is one of the most fearful warnings in the Bible. And the smoke of their torment ascend forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night. Who worship the beast and his image. And whoever receives the mark of his name. Now this is very, very interesting. Those who keep the seventh day Sabbath are going to have an understanding of what's going on here. What does the word Sabbath mean? Rest. But here we see those, there's no rest, day or night, for these people. What is the Bible talking about? It's a contrast, isn't it? God will have a people that have found true rest. And a sign of that is they observe the seventh day Sabbath. We continue. So this is false worship here. Worship the beast and worship the image and whoever receives the mark of his name. God is warning us to not worship the beast, not worship the image of the beast, not receive the mark of the beast. So does God give these warnings in love? Yes or no? Yes, they're given in love. And so notice the central issue in the last days revolves around worship. True versus false worship. Then listen carefully to the next verse that describes those who worship the Creator. So we've read the, the, the first angel's message, third angel's message. And then after John sees these angels doing flyovers of planet Earth. Angel 1, angel 2, angel 3. He sees them in midair. He sees them as he's looking up in his, in his vision. And then... He's directed to look down to those who are preaching and teaching these messages. Notice. Now this next verse describes those who are preaching God's final warning to the world with a compelling voice. And we want to be in this number. Notice. Here, read it together with me. Everybody nice and loud from the back row to the front row. Here we go. Here. Whoops. Let me go back. Here we go. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep nine of the commandments of God. Here are those who keep the commandments. Those who keep the commandments of God. That includes the seventh day Sabbath. And the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 6 through 12. So therefore, these are the ones who do not worship the beast. And they don't receive the mark of the beast. And they don't worship the image of the beast. Do you want to be in that group? Yes or no? This is the Bible's very clear. Very descriptive of this singular group that make it. They get the seal of God. They don't get the mark of the beast. They worship the creator. They don't worship the beast or worship the image of the beast. So they get the seal of God, not the mark of the beast. I want to be in that number. And friends, we can be part of that now. We can be part of that now. So is there a commandment that actually uses the word worship of the creator or talks about the one who made us. Let's go to the fourth commandment real quick. We know that worship is associated with the Sabbath. Read Isaiah 66 for that. But then in I, uh, Exodus 20, we, sa we read verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. This is Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So it's a holy day. Six days you shall do all your work. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's the Lord's day, Saturday. From sundown Friday night, sundown Saturday night. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And you got to combine this with Isaiah 66. So that you can see that worship 
even though the word worship is not right there directly, you, it's talking about that. Because look at Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Looking here. Isaiah 66. Verse 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to other, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. What commandment talks about the Sabbath, the fourth commandment? What does it say? That we keep the Sabbath in honor of of him who made us, right? That's why we keep the Sabbath in, re in remembrance that he created us. He redeemed us. So worship is tied to the seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment. And here it is linked very clearly. I should have put that up on the screen. Isaiah 66, 22, 23. But there you have it. The word Sabbath is connected with the word worship. In the fourth commandment, you have... Uh, the Sabbath there, and it says don't work on that day. Why? Because it's for worship. So, the seal is given before the tribulation, holding the four winds of the earth. The tribulation is coming. The seven last plagues are coming. We must prepare. Number two, those who are sealed are protected from the seven last plagues. So, the seal is given to those who truly seek to prepare for the final crisis. They are safe in God's hands. You believe that? Look at Psalms 91. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, my what? My refuge. My what? Refuge. Even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Psalms 91, it pays to follow Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be protected from the plagues. Fl plagues will fall around us, but not on us. So notice here, Revelation 7, Revelation 14 makes it very clear. Point number three, everyone will either receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast. The book of Revelation is a book of contrasts. You've got the saved, you've got the lost. You've got the dragon, you've got the lamb. You've got the pure woman of Revelation 12, and you've got the harlot, a mother and her daughters, Revelation 17, 18. You've got Babylon, you've got the new Jerusalem, and on and on and on. You've got those that are marked, mark of the beast, and those who get the seal of God. So many, there's number seven throughout the book of Revelation, and then there's the 666. The book of Revelation is a book of contrast. You have those that receive the seven last plagues, and those who are protected from the seven last plagues, and on and on it goes. So the seal is the opposite of the mark of the beast. Hmm. Number five, the saved have a seal on, uh, placed on their forehead. The forehead is a symbol of decisions. We must choose whom we will serve. What does the Bible say about that? And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But everybody together, here we go. But as for me and my house, we will, that's a decision, that's a choice, we choose we will serve the Lord. That's a decision. That's a decision. You know what makes up our life? You know what makes up our character? Not circumstances. You know what makes up our character? Is decisions that we make in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. We cannot always control circumstances. But God can guide our decision making. Amen. And so those who get the seal of God... They choose to receive the seal of God. They don't just accidentally, oh, I got sealed. No, how many agree God is enlightening his people in the last days that we want to be sealed. And that will happen just prior to the tribulation. So that's very, very, very soon. So God wants us to be settled into the truth now so that when he finally seals, we have already been settling into the truth. So Revelation 7, 1 to 3 makes it very clear, presents not only a sobering prophecy about the tribulation, but also the good news that God will seal his faithful servants in or 
or on. The word in and on are used interchangeably. Uh, they're foreheads. And the forehead is a symbol of decisions and choices, the frontal lobe function of the brain. This is not a literal seal, but a symbolic one, a spiritual one. The forehead is a symbol of decision to follow God or man. It has to do with our moral choices. The frontal lobe function of the brain is where we discern, where we remember, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. We remember his scriptures. We remember his commands. We remember his promises. We remember who we belong to, our creator, redeemer. And so remember or choose and judge and discern of what we believe. It's all done in the frontal lobe function of the brain. So those who choose to serve God and keep all of his commandments, including the Seventh-day Sabbath, receive the seal of the living God. Every person must choose whom they will obey, whom their heart uh, who, who from their heart, self versus Savior, man versus Jesus, we must be a servant of God. So what does it say? In Romans 6:16, 6, "Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to what? obey. You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to what? Righteousness. So we must choose life, choose to obey God rather than man. Number six, all about the seal. This is very comprehensive uh, Bible teaching on the seal of God. And I want you to notice, I, I really believe with all my heart, is this is one of the most comprehensive messages that you've heard on the seal of God and on the mark of the beast. And I praise God, I want you to know that I have been spending weeks and weeks in fine-tuning and improving my messages on the mark of the beast. So I've never been more excited about presenting these topics after spending weeks and weeks of studying these things. And of course, I'm 62 years old. I've mentioned that. I've been preaching these things since 1979. It's a few years back. But I'm telling you, I've never been more excited and more such understanding of the mark of the beast and the seal of God and the Antichrist beast than I am today. So number six, the seal is not literal, but symbolic and spiritual. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. I want to just qualify something. Any new revelation or any of the ability to give a comprehensive message like this, Jesus gets the glory. So this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Now notice here, so God places both the law of God and the seal of God in the same place. In the foreheads of those who decide on purpose to obey God. Number seven. The seal is in the law of God. Now, a lot of what I'm sharing here tonight is somewhat repetitious, but repetition is the key to retention, and it's just like a diamond. You look at a diamond in the light, and you look at shimmers and glimmers, and you look at diff different views of it and so forth. Well, we're looking at the diamond of truth. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples, Isaiah 8, verse 16. So the seal of God and the law of God go together. Are you with me thus far? Yes or no? Can you see this? All right, we're putting the puzzle together. All right, here we go. So number eight, God writes his law in our hearts and minds, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. Notice, in and on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Hebrews 8.10. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your laws within my heart. Uh, Psalms 40, verse 8. So both the seal of God and the law of God is to be written in our hearts in these end times, which include the Sabbath. Number nine. The seal of God is placed on the foreheads of those who keep the commandments of God, including the Sabbath. Seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. Revelation 7 verse 3. Sealed ones keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. So number 10. 
Those who worship the Creator receive the seal. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Revelation 14, 7. Number 11. The Holy Spirit is sealing us. Do not and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Ephesians 4, 30. Therefore, we must listen to the faintest whisper of the Holy Spirit if we want to be sealed. We must what? Cooperate with the Spirit of God in our hearts, then we have nothing to fear. Paul said in Philippians 2.13 that God is working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. There's the decision, I will obey, and then there's actually doing it. How many agree? Both are important. And so God gives us those D's of, of, of desire and decision. Okay, so we must cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Doesn't that make uh, e uh, spiritual sense? That the Holy Spirit puts this seal in our heart and helps us to avoid the mark of the beast. You know what? If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're in trouble. But the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is a gift. Is a gift for who? For sinners. How many are thankful <laughs> you're never going to earn the Holy Spirit? You can't even be holy. You don't have one holy desire without the Holy Spirit. How many are thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit? And how do we know how the Holy... We can't see the Holy Spirit. So how do we know how the Holy Spirit operates? With the Word of God. How did we get the Word of God? Through the Holy Spirit. We could do a whole series on the Holy Spirit. And so notice here, number 12... The seal is connected with the Sabbath, therefore. This Sabbath commandment is alluded to in the first angel's message, Revelation 14. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So compare that to the fourth commandment. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rest of the seventh day. What is this talking about? The first angel's message is like a finger on the fourth commandment. The first angel is drawing our attention back to the most neglected commandment among Christians today. The one that is most forgotten begins with the word remember. So the first angel is drawing our attention back to the fourth commandment of God. There it is. That's the tie. And so that's why we know that worship is associated with the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is not a day to just say, okay, I have that day off. It's a day of worship. The whole day is to worship God. Amen? Now that doesn't mean you're in church all day. One of the best things you can do is go out in nature. What did Adam and Eve do on the Sabbath? They were already in nature. They were already in the Garden of Eden. So the final warning to mankind in Revelation 14, 6 through 12 draws attention to the most neglected of the Ten Commandments. Revelation 14, 7 presents an urgent message to worship Him who made, worship our Creator, and keep the Creator's day holy. He said, but Mark, what's the mark of the beast? You must first nail down the seal of God. Number 13, the seal of God shows His ownership and authority. We belong to God. He made us. We belong to him by creation and redemption. He purchased us. How many agree? We are valuable. We are valuable. When I see people beating up on themselves and berating themselves and just really beating up on themselves as though that could earn salvation, we must realize, yes, we must feel sorry for any sin or any mistake that we make and so forth. But we must realize that God valued us so much that he sent his son to die for us. I say that's a lot of value that he places on us. We are made after the image of God. We are special by creation and redemption. Do you believe that? So number 14. In ancient times, kings sealed or signed their things into law. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the what? King's signet ring. Esther 3, verse 12. So number 15. Oh, and by the way, I got to mention something else about that. So the image on, on the ring, on the signet ring of the king, to authenticate and authorize a law or document would take the ring and impress the, that image that's on it, impress that upon pliable clay, 
not cement, pliable clay or melted wax. In other words, something that could receive the impression. That's what Jesus wants to do for us. He melts our heart so that he can press his character upon us. How many agree we want to be pliable in the master's hand? He is the potter, we are the clay. Amen? We want the Holy Spirit to melt our hearts. That's why we look at Calvary and it melts our heart. And then God says, now that your heart is softened and melted, I can impress my character upon you. Is that good news? And so notice number 15, those who are sealed keep the commandments of God, including the seventh day Sabbath. It, Revelation 14, it must include the fourth because if you break one, you break them all. So, Number 16, a seal has three elements, name, title, and territory. Only the Sabbath has all those three. Now remember, a seal has to do with authority. And our King of kings and Lord of lords has a sign of his authority in the law of God. The Sabbath is the only commandment that reveals the lawgiver. This is the only one that contains all three essential elements in a seal, which is name, title, and territory. So let's see if you see it. Fourth commandment. You have the Lord your God. That's his, that's his name. The Lord made. That's his title, creator. Territory, the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. My friends, there you have it. As you can see, the Sabbath commandment contains all three essential elements of a seal. The Lord creator, heaven and earth. Amen. That's pretty clear. Number 17, seal and sign are used interchangeably. Quote, and he received a sign of circumcision and a seal, sign, seal of the righteousness of the faith. Romans 4 verse 11. So number 18, the seal is the Sabbath. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign or seal. Remember, they're used interchangeably between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who does what? Sanctifies them. So the Sabbath is more than a day. It represents the fact that he saves us, that he's changing us, that he's making us holy, that he's sanctifying us. Listen to this. The Sabbath was set apart as a holy day. It's different from any other day. It's set apart. The word sanctify means set apart. Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is true. John 17 verse 17. The Sabbath is a sign that he set us apart. We're different from the world. The world says we don't care what day. We don't, we don't have to listen to that law of God. But God's people are set apart. And the seventh day Sabbath is a sign we've been set apart. Never try to be part of this world. We are not. This is not our home. We are pilgrims and strangers in a foreign land. How many agree? This is not heaven. We are on our way to heaven. And our goal is twofold. Develop a character like Christ and be a soul winner for Christ. Those are the two things that God is looking for us to do. Become like Christ and a soul winner like Christ. How many want to be a soul winner for Jesus Christ? Amen. And now listen. For example, some might of you might not get around like you would like. You don't have the energy or the strength or whatever to maybe go door to door or whatever. You know, there's a variety of ways we can witness begin in our home with our children, or grandchildren and so forth. But we can all do something. One of the best things you can do in soul winning is pray for people. And we could go on and on. We could do a whole series about soul winning. But I want you to notice here, I am the Lord who sanctifies them. That's the Lord's doing. He is the one who makes us holy. And so, hallow my Sabbath. How can you keep the Sabbath holy unless he's making you holy? So notice, hallow my Sabbath, and they will be a sign or seal between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Ezekiel 20, verse 20. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign or seal between me and the children of Israel, and we are modern Israel. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Romans 2, 28 and 29. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, 29. And so... And the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made, created the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day rested and was refreshed. Exodus uh, uh, 31. 
So the Sabbath is a sign of a character change by the power of Jesus. It is a sign or seal of Jesus' power to create us and also to recreate us, to save us from sin. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Many people want to be saved in their sin. No, no, no. Jesus saves us from sin. Matthew 1, 21. Furthermore, David cried out, and this should be our prayer, created me a what kind of heart? A clean heart. Amen. That's Psalms 51 verse 10. What a good prayer that is. And so number 19, the seal is a sign of loyalty and obedience. Loyalty and obedience. And so number 20, the seal is associated with true worship of our creator and on his holy day. So the seal is tied to worshiping of our creator, especially worshiping him on his special day. And I've already read this verse about on the new earth, the meek shall inherit the earth ultimately after the millennium, Matthew 5 verse 5. And we're going to continue from one Sabbath to another. All flesh shall come to do what on the Sabbath? Worship before me, says the Lord. Notice that even in the earth made new, we will come together on the seventh day Sabbath to worship our Creator and Redeemer. So now every Sabbath we gather together to worship God is a beautiful foretaste of heaven. And those of you who are watching online, thousands and thousands of you watching, if you would like to receive a link to a Seventh-day Keeping Church in your area, all you need to do is simply email us, text us, or call us. And all that information is either on the screen or it's at the description box. We can help you find a church that honors the seventh day. Is this important for all those watching and listening from around the world? It is, is this important? Let them hear that you're here. Is it important that they find a seventh day keeping church? Amen? And so our audience is in favor of everybody watching and listening from around the world, perhaps millions, that uh, you will find a seventh day keeping church and we can help you do that. Call us toll free if you're in the United States or text us, text the word Bible to 74121 by texting or you can email us at amazingprophecies at gmail.com. So I love this verse, Revelation 4 verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Revelation 4 verse 11. So he's worthy because he created us. So notice here, God, number 20, God made the seventh day holy. No man can make a day holy. God wrote and spoke the Ten Commandments when he said the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And so God calls the Sabbath my holy day. Who does it belong to? Belongs to the Lord, but he made it for man. Mark 2, 27, 28. And that's Isaiah 58, verse 13. Number 22, the seal is associated with the number seven of the seventh day Sabbath. God has tested his people with that number seven uh, down through time. And so thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed, notice he did three things to the seventh day. Blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which he, God had created and made. He blessed it, he sanctified it, made it holy, and rested upon it. So the seventh day is mentioned three times in these two verses. This is the first time when the seventh day mentioned in the Bible. God's special number throughout the scripture is the number seven. Also notice that God gave the Sabbath at the beginning of time, a long time before the existence of a Jew. The Sabbath was meant for everyone. Now, the book of Revelation is full of the significant number seven. Consider how significant the number seven is in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we have what? We have seven stars in Jesus' right hand. Seven angels, a lamb with seven eyes, seven spirits, seven horns, seven thunders, dragon with seven heads, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven plagues, and more sevens. So isn't it interesting that that book is identifying a people that are set apart with the number seven, with the seventh day Sabbath. Isn't that clear, friends? Isn't that powerful? Number 23, 
The final contest between good and evil revolves around the Ten Commandments, as you can see clearly, especially the seventh day Sabbath. Number 24, seal is based on God's authority versus man's authority. 25, those who are sealed preach the warnings of the three angels' messages. There is only one church that is preaching the three angels' messages around the world. Only one. I hope you're part of that remnant church. And so you can reach out to us if you would like to be part of God's remnant church. Number 26, no one has the mark of the beast yet, nor the seal of God, till it is enforced. And that hasn't happened yet abroad. The conclusion is the Sabbath is the seal of God. Now let us discover what is the mark of the beast. Would you agree? That was pretty thorough. Maybe too thorough. But at any rate, I mean, we just looked at different dimensions of it and so forth with these cluster of verses. And so there you have it. So we have identified the Antichrist beast, Revelation 13. We have identified the seal of God thoroughly, comprehensively. The subject of the mark of the beast intrigues and captivates the attention of countless millions of people around the world. A Google search on the controversial subject of the mark of the beast, this hot topic, has a whopping 181 million results. Mark of the beast, there in a Google search, 181 million uh, results. And that is uh, of websites and different articles or videos that they have there in Google search. Look up the word Antichrist, 17.7 million. Sabbath, 56.5 million. Can I tell you what I've discovered on our YouTube channel? There are so many people. I'm talking to you, watching us. So many people that are open to the seventh day Sabbath. It is absolutely thrilling, thrilling. And you need to get our newsletter. So thrilling. I just got goosebumps because it's exciting. It's exciting. We get phone calls, emails, texts of people telling us, I believe that. I believe that. What church you recommend? Friends, I praise God. We've given about 150 series like this or comparable to this. But we are seeing more people, reaching more people than I've reached in all our crusades combined every single day. Thousands and thousands of people. Friends, the three angels' messages is going out, preached around the world with a loud voice. Can you shout amen to Jesus for that? And so notice here. So yeah, so look. Look up the word Vatican, 174 million. Look up Book of Revelation, 106 million. Praise the Lord. By the way, I hope you pray for our worldwide outreach. I hope you pray because we are seeing so many people message us, text us, email us, pleading for help, pleading. And they'll even put that word in caps sometimes, exclamation, help me, help me. And we have staff and wanting to expand and so forth. But I'm here to tell you, there are there's people just pleading and begging for truth and counsel and victory in their lives and so forth. So let us pray together for these things. And so once again, let us read God's last call to this perishing world, the three angels' messages that contain some of the keys to unlock some of the greatest mysteries of the mark of the beast. Remember, we cannot afford to engage in fancy guesswork or be content with a superficial interest in this topic because these are life and death issues that affect us all. Our world is racing toward the final showdown between good and evil. And now is the time to slow down Go deep in our Bible study of end time prophecies of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Now let us read again the three angels' messages. I'm just going to read portions of it. Worship him who made. Okay. And then, in contrast to that, anyone who worships the beast is going to be lost if they continue to follow that, even though... It's, and it's being enforced. Once that worship is enforced and people know better and they still refuse to make a change, I just read the scripture. You can see what it says. That's why we want to be in this group. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then, then we're safe if we're following. Now, no church can save us, but we need the truth to set us free. 
So now let us read two verses in Revelation 13 that show us how and where the mark of the beast will be enforced. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark of the right on the right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell economic boycott, economic sanctions, except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the dragon, the devil, is enraged with the woman, the church, those who keep the commandments of God, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring and keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17. So only a remnant are going to be preaching and believing this. But God's truth is on the march. The torch of truth is being passed along. These powerful verses reveal God's final warning to the world. And in them, we discover a number of vital facts about the infamous mark of the beast. Number one, are you ready for this? Yes or no? Number one, everyone will be found worshiping the creator or worshiping the beast in the last days. The stark contrast is drawn here for good reasons. Worship him who made, that is, worship the, who created heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water, or worships the beast, that is, worships the Roman papal power, and both Protestants and Catholics will do that unless they learn the truth, follow the truth, and are set apart. Worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. Now, no one has that yet. But it's about to be enforced. Revelation 14 verse 9. So since the beast power is the Roman papal power. We can know categorically that this is religious false popular worship. Promoted by a corrupt religious power. So clearly the end time showdown central issue is over religious worship. The important term worship is used 198 times in the New King James Version. The term worthy is used 51 times. Number two. So ultimately everyone receives either the seal of God or the mark of the beast based on their moral decisions. The entire world will be polarized into how many groups? Two groups. Everyone will need to choose between true worship versus false worship. A choice between true day of worship and a counterfeit or false day of worship. Number three, like the seal of God and its counterpart, the mark of the beast are not a literal or physical one, but spiritual or symbolic. Here is more proof, for example, that the seal of God and the mark of the beast are not visible except to God. Literal or figurative, symbolic beast, symbolic image, symbolic name, symbolic number, symbolic seal, symbolic mark. So the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, figurative also of God's people in the last days here all over the world. And so remember, he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, Romans 2, 28, 29, and put a mark on their foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done and done within it. Would you agree? Changing God's 10 commandments is an abomination before the Lord. And those who sigh and cry saying, oh Lord, help your people to know the truth. Please Jesus. And we weep for souls and we pray for souls Soon you're going to get a mark. The mark, seal, and sign are used interchangeably. Not a visible mark or sign or seal. But God is going to sign those who sigh and cry for the abominations that are in the land. Would you agree? This is not casual Christianity. This is where your heart is in this. You feel for people. You love people. You're not going around to bash people with the truth. You're going to help people with the truth. Amen? And so sigh and cry over the abominations that are within it. They are the ones that are sealed, thus protected. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. Deuteronomy 6, 8. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live in my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Notice this is figurative of real spiritual life and experience. Proverbs 7, 1 to 3. Number four. A key point is that the mark of the beast is the opposite of the seal of God. Therefore, Sunday is the mark of the beast. Number five. 
What does the Roman Catholic Church claim as a sign of their religious power and authority? The Roman Catholic Church makes the outrageous, inflated, false claims that God gave them the authority to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Therefore, Sunday is their admitted, claimed mark. Listen to these absolutely presumptuous, shameless claims. Of course, this is H.F. Thomas, Chancellor for the Cardinal, 1895. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. It could not have been otherwise, as none in those days would have dreamed of doing anything in matters spiritual, ecclesiastical, and religious without her. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Here's another one. Catholic source. The observance of Sunday by the Protestants is in homage they pay, in spite of themselves, to the authority of the Catholic Church. Now, some might say, well, Mark, I did not know this. This is new to me. Well, praise God. Now you know. It's wonderful to learn new things from the Word of God. But, Mark, this will require a big change. Jesus made a change. He went down from, he came down from heaven. Would you agree? That's the biggest change of all, for Jesus to come down here to this dark planet to save the likes of us. How many agree? How can we talk about change being too difficult? Jesus set the pace for us. Amen. We must be willing to take up our cross and follow Jesus. What's the cross for? Self-surrender. Self-surrender. Many people want to follow Jesus. They just don't want to pick up the cross. How many agree? If you're going to get the crown of glory, you must take up the cross. Amen. So the Catholic Church is right. When people choose to obey the church rather than God in the matter of their chosen day of worship, that day then does become the mark of authority of that church. Listen to what they say in Catholic Record 1923, Sunday is our mark of authority. There you have it. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Here's another quote, Catholic quote. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Those of you who are watching us from around the world, I just want to tell you here in our audience, you can hear a pin drop. That kind of means something. Number six, the Roman Catholic Church has created a direct counterfeit to the Seventh-day Sabbath and replacing it with Sunday worship. A counterfeit is dangerous only when it looks so real that it fools people. And Sunday seems almost like the real Sabbath of the Bible. It's the very next day to the seventh. So it can't be much closer in that respect. Satan's counterfeits so closely resemble the genuine that they deceive those willing to be deceived. The Roman papal power has many counterfeits that may seem to closely resemble genuine Bible-based beliefs, but are not genuine. For example, infant baptism instead of baptism by immersion. That's a counterfeit. The counterfeit of confession to a priest versus confession of sins to God alone. Church tradition versus Bible truth. Declaring the Mass to be the real flesh of Jesus versus symbolic Lord's Supper, Sunday worship instead of the Sabbath. Would you agree that devil has a counterfeit for every truth of God? So the truth of God's word exposes these counterfeits for what they are. Jesus promised you shall know, not guess the truth. You shall what everybody? You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, forever free in the name of our ministry, forever free. Do you see now why? We've called our ministry Forever Free Ministries. How many can see that? Truth is a treasure. John 8, 32. Number seven. How will the mark of the beast be enforced? Or I should say be received. How will it be received? He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on the right hands or right hand or on their foreheads. The mark of the beast on the forehead represents a decision to accept the false Sabbath when it is enforced by law. Again, the forehead represents the mind. A person will be marked forever in the forehead by their decision to honor Sunday as a holy day based on being deceived. Number eight. Those who receive the mark of the beast in the hand are those who go along with the crowd to avoid persecution. They don't necessarily believe it, but the peer pressure. They want to save their job. They want to have their family happy. They embrace, uh, you know, they want to they make peace in the family. Oh, my family would oppose this. 
I guess I'm not going to go along with the seventh day Sabbath. Friends, we got to put Jesus first. Love our family. By the way, when you know the truth, that should cause you to love your family more than ever, even if they oppose you. Amen. They embrace Sunday worship out of fear or not willing to sacrifice in order to please God. The hand has to do with actions or work. Whatever, Ecclesiastes 9, 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. So there will be many who go along with the Sunday laws, even if they know better because they give in to the peer pressure. A person will be marked in their hand by working on God's holy Sabbath or by going along with the Sunday laws for various reasons, such as wanting to save their job or to please their family. The sign or the mark for either God or the beast power will be invisible to everyone but God. Quote, 2 Timothy 2.19. Will you read this with me? Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Isn't that powerful? Number nine. Does anyone have the mark of the beast today? No one has the mark of the beast yet. The mark of the beast will be received in the near future when the civil authorities enforce Sunday as a day of worship. And those who choose to honor this false Sabbath will then receive it. So now is the time to decide to follow Jesus, even if it requires a significant change. Hey, you might need to tell your boss you're not going to work on the seventh day Sabbath. Now is the time to prepare the global for the global crisis that is fast approaching. Number 10. Those who receive the seal of God will not receive the mark of the beast. This is resounding good news that we can actually avoid ever getting the mark of the beast. We can be fully, completely protected from the dreadful mark. Don't you want to be protected? Right? You know, when you think about what you want foremostly for your family, you want them to be safe. Is that true? Yes or no? Isn't that like top priority? You want them to be safe, right? You know, we should pray every time we get in the car, by the way. One of the most dangerous things you'll ever do in your life is drive. And so, <laughs> you know, so how many agree? Before you put it in reverse or put it in drive, pray. All those in favor say aye. You better do it. So, number 11, those who receive the mark of the beast will receive the seven last plagues. How much more serious can you get? How can anyone be guessing about this? Then I heard a loud voice from he the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl on the earth, upon the earth. This is during the tribulation. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worship the beast. Revelation 16, 1 and 2. So here we see that the horrific punishing plagues are poured out upon those who receive the mark of the beast. No wonder we cannot afford to speculate about the issues here. So you're either going to get God mad at you or you're going to have man mad at you, so to speak. I would rather receive the wrath of man than the wrath of God. How about you? And so, number 12. Those who keep the commandments of God, including his holy Sabbath, will not receive the mark of the beast. The Bible clearly describes those who are preaching these messages about the mark of the beast as those who keep the commandments of God. Number 13, the mark of the beast is given to those who refuse to give up worshiping the beast. They just won't budge. And its image, God will give everyone an opportunity. Everybody say opportunity. God is a God of love. I know this is a heavy, heavy final test that's coming. Yes, it's heavy. It's heavy. Very heavy. But God gives every person an opportunity to hear the truth before he comes. Everybody has to have some measure of opportunity before Jesus comes. God will give everyone an opportunity to know the truth and follow it or not follow it. And then comes the mark of the beast and, and the tribulation and the plagues by choosing to continue to honor Sunday as the Sabbath, regardless of there being no evidence that it is holy, they made the fatal mistake that has eternal consequences. I repeat, no one has the mark of the beast now. Number 14, what does it mean to worship the image to the beast? Now, this is very, very significant because it talks about don't worship the image of the beast. In Revelation 13, Revelation uh, chapter 14, 
And uh, so, and also Revelation 16, I believe, the image to the beast is church and state uniting to enforce a national Sunday law, the mark of the beast. If it's an Im image to the beast, who's the beast? The Roman papal power. What is the Roman papal power? A political religious entity all combined in one. A matter of fact, the person that's head of the political state of the Vatican, it's the Pope. Their religious leader of 1.2 million billion uh, Catholics, the Pope. So you have the unity of church and state. That's the Vatican. That's the Roman Catholic Church and political entity. For there to be an image of the beast in the United States means that church and state will unite to enforce a national Sunday what? A law. It'll become law. So when Catholic and Protestant churches unite to pressure the government to pass Sunday law, then we shall see the horrible consequences of false force. Notice, false forced worship, contrary to God's Sabbath. By the way, does God ever use force? Never. God, rather than the F word force, with God it's free will. Free will. Free to choose. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. This will usher in a time of trouble such as never before. Daniel 12, verse 1. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 3, 10. So the test is coming. Number 15. There is no doubt that Sunday sacredness is the mark of the beast, but will only be received when it is enforced by the government. Sunday laws are coming, ready or not, they are coming. Number 16, the mark of the beast has to do with popular false worship. So does Sunday worship. The final test is about worship, popular worship versus unpopular worship. Only a remnant go with the unpopular worship. Number 17, those who receive the mark of the beast will lose eternal life. They not only receive the seven last plagues, but they, receive, they lose out on eternal life. No wonder we need to love people. Number 18, the papacy in the world will seek to force everyone to worship the beast and receive the mark of the beast. God never uses force, but rather seeks to lead us to make decisions with our own free will to serve him in all we do. Number 19, how will the mark of the beast be enforced? Those who refuse the mark of the beast will not be able to do what? Buy or sell. Is buying and selling important? Uh, yeah. You would not even be here if you didn't buy some gasoline. Matter of fact, you wouldn't be here if you didn't purchase a car. And uh, so they will be denied buying and selling. Now, you might have people that just give you food. But most of us have to buy our food. And so notice, they will be denied buying and selling. So the government can empty bank accounts in a flash. Is that true? Yes or no? You can be digitally disabled in a flash. Matter of fact, if you ever lose your credit card, what do you need to do? You just call them right away. Boom. Whoever got, has that car is not worth anything. You're protected. And so it's amazing how fast that can happen. And so those who are faithful to God will face the swift and harsh economic boycott. They will be denied buying and selling. Number 20, technologies such as an implantable chip or national ID card are not the mark of the beast, but could be used, listen carefully, but could be used to identify those who keep Sunday or not. So technology is not the mark of the beast, but it can be used to identify who's keeping Sunday and who's not. Surveillance cameras can be used. All these things could be used by the government, <laughs> big government, to enforce a national Sunday law. The government can use biometrics such as facial recognition, finger recognition, hand recognition, um, computer chip or surveillance cameras, etc., to identify those who are not honoring a national Sunday law. Friends, we're coming at a time when it's not just the government that's going to do this. You're going to have the whole world that are keeping their eyes open who's keeping Sunday and who's not. Friends, we are racing towards that. Do you realize what's happening to our society just in the last few years? Friends, you are seeing the erosion 
of our liberties. Big government is not our enemy. It's rather the religious systems on this planet right now moving towards putting church, putting pressure on the state to enforce a national Sunday law. So what is to fear? The Antichrist beast and the false prophet. That's coming up in a future presentation right here. I'm going to show you from the Bible that the false prophet is the United States of America. Apostate Protestantism. I'll get, it, I'll get into this in a future presentation. There's a whole bunch of things I want to share, but it's not, not, not quite yet. All right, number 21. Just stay tuned. Everybody say, stay tuned. Summary, worship the Creator and receive the seal of God or worship the beast and receive the mark of the beast. Thus, the last test is about worship. All right. Could there really be a national Sunday law one day soon? Sunday blue laws already exist. They are legal. And there are many state books. Blue laws are on the state books of 28 states. Done my homework. What are the Sunday blue laws? Blue laws, laws concerning religious restrictions came to be known more commonly as Sunday laws due to the day of the week that was mainly affected. They began to be put into practice in the United States of America during the 1600s and prohibited travel, work, and even sales on Sundays. Some of these are still in existence in certain countries and states and also in different countries around the world. And uh, so, what is the position of the Supreme Court in regard to Sunday blue laws? By the way, I will be covering more about this, the Supreme Court coming up this week. So what is the position of the Supreme Court in regard to Sunday blue laws? The Supreme Court upholds Sunday blue laws. Now that's a violation, I believe, of the U.S. Constitution. Blue laws were enacted in the United States as religiously based statutes designed to promote the, what they call the Christian Sabbath, Sunday. But it's not the Christian Sabbath. It's the seventh day is the Christian Sabbath. But anyway, despite the initial... Despite the initially religious motivation behind blue laws, the United States Supreme Court has modernly upheld Sunday closing laws as constitutional because, we could hear a drum roll on this one, they support a valid secular purpose. Oh, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember this, everybody. I love U.S. history. And history is in the making right now, and it's not pretty. They support a valid secular purpose under the First Amendment's free exercise clause by encouraging a universal day of rest. And that's where we stand up and say, this is not right. Likewise, the Supreme Court has also upheld blue laws on establishment clause grounds because the laws do not promote one religion over another according to their opinion. And so, because of the secularizing of America, most blue laws have been repealed in the United States. Although some states ban the sale of alcoholic beverages on Sundays and many states ban selling cars on Sundays. Puritans had Sunday blue laws. The Puritans expected everyone to attend church on Sunday and were forbidden to participate in any type of work or play. Liquor was also forbidden to be sold on the Sabbath. Wait until you hear what happened when I visited the Plymouth Plantation a number of years ago as I interviewed someone there that was playing the role of Pastor Bradford, I believe was his name, Wait until you hear what he said to me. Has everything to do with what I'm sharing. The laws were written by the Puritans in books with blue paper binding. I didn't know that. Therefore, these laws were labeled the blue laws. And now, as Paul Harvey said, you know the what of the story? The rest of the story. Pope Benedict promoted Sunday rest. By defending Sunday, one defends human freedom. Sunday is the day of the Lord. 
and man a day which everyone must be able to be free, free for the family and free for God, Pope Benedict. The late Pope John Paul II in his encyclical entitled Dies Domini, which means the Lord's Day, referring to Sunday, a whole encyclical promoting Sunday uh, sacredness. Pope John Paul II encouraged Sunday laws. In this matter, my predecessor, Pope Leo XIII, in his encyclical rerum, spoke of Sunday rest as a worker's right, which the state must guarantee. Watch labor unions. Watch labor unions and how labor unions come together and they're united saying, we need to have Sunday off, Sunday rest. Watch this. Watch how it all plays together to have a national Sunday law that everybody must abide by or face not being able to buy or sell and face potentially a death decree according to Revelation 13 verse 15. So the state, what would you call that? If Sunday rest uh, is guaranteed by the state, what does that mean? Sunday law. Pope John Paul II, by the way, who was just promoted, even though he's dead now, he's promoted to be a saint that you can pray to, is my understanding. And, um, you know, because the saints can help you. Friends, all we need is Jesus. And now, Laudato Si, on care for our common home, Pope Francis in his notable encyclical on the environment, entitled Laudato Si, on care for our common home, vigorously promotes Sunday as a day of rest. By the way, I'm going to show you some different video clips coming up this week. And so notice here, vigorously promotes Sunday as a day of rest. Pope Francis is here promoting a false Sabbath, counterfeit Sabbath. Quote, this is Pope Francis. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, the Bible doesn't say that Sabbath is just for the Jews, it's for everybody, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. What is he saying? If you're going to take care of the environment, you need moral motivation, and that moral motivation will come through observing Sunday rest. The Roman Catholic Catechism makes it clear that Sunday rest should be legislated. Quote, in respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sundays and the church's holy days as what? Legal holidays. Legal holidays. So what could lead majority to desire a national Sunday law? Natural disasters. Do you see fires just all of a sudden just stopping in the West? Or do you kind of have a feeling that this trend may continue? That beautiful California, Colorado, Idaho, Washington, Oregon. Would you agree this, will get a, this is getting a lot of people's attention? And the Pope is there to say, we need Sunday rest to help the environment. I'll be getting into that more. Coronavirus, the Pope has said, the coronavirus is linked to climate change. We need Sunday observance. And so, the Sunday law is not going to come about because Pope Francis wants it Nobody else really wants it, but they got to give in to the Pope. That's not the way it's going to be. It's rather the Pope and apostate Protestantism influencing the masses and the masses believing it or going along because of pressure. And what's going to happen? The whole world is going to say, we need Sunday law. It's going to be popular demand. And the politicians, some of them that are not corrupt, will say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, that violates the U.S. Constitution of the Bill of Rights. We, we can't enforce that. And then will come more pressure on politicians. And they will all end up, if they're not faithful, some, some I believe will come out of that. But many are going to become more corrupt. Friends, we are facing some very tumultuous days here in the United States. I see more 
social unrest in the horizon. And friends, some other things that could lead to a national Sunday law. Can you imagine if North Korea got weapons or some other nation or we got attacked by China or Russia and pulverized the city of Miami? Just polarized it, two million dead, just like that. How many agree? People would go back to church real quick. And they would say, we need to get back to God. We need to get back to church. We need a Sunday law. How about a, a massive catastrophic economic collapse. Let me tell you something. When people, when people start messing with your wallet, it gets your attention. And what if just all the bottom falls out? People will say, we need a Sunday law. Many things could lead to a national Sunday law. Climate change, economic collapse, nuclear war, social unrest, rampant immorality. Hey, we need God. We need a Sunday law. I say, yes, we need God. Yes, we need to go back to church, but it shouldn't be legislated. Sweeping false revival could all lead to a national Sunday law and a quest to get back to God, but it is the wrong solution. Since Sunday worship is in conflict with the true day of worship on Saturday, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, I have much more. I'm not even quite finished, but I'm going to I'm going to continue to be, how many want to learn some more of what's going on? I will show you video clips. I'll show you that what we're talking about is relevant to tonight's news and tomorrow's news and the next, next day's news, because I'm here to tell you, these are the last days. How many tonight want to say, I choose God to obey God to obey his commandments rather than man-made commandments. If that's your desire, stand to your feet. Those watching from around the world, I urge you to make a decision. You can leave a comment below. I choose to obey God's seventh-day Sabbath. I choose to obey God. Email us, amazingprophecies at gmail.com. Call us, text us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, We've learned a lot tonight. And I know right now our head is, maybe our head's a little dizzy after going through this for over an hour. But Lord, I know you will help us to assimilate it. Help us, Lord, to go forth knowing that we have learned the truth. No turning back. In Jesus' name, amen.